All right, we are going to go over Algebra 1 Regents January 2024. Today I'm going to go over numbers 13 to 20. So if you want to do those problems first and then come back and see if you got them right, go for it. I'll put the link to the test um, in the description of the video below. All right, so let's get to it. Number 13 starts us off with a parabola. The function f of x is graphed on the set of axes below. And they want to know what is the equation for the axis of symmetry of f of x. So this is really a vocabulary thing, right? Do you know what an axis of symmetry is for a parabola? So the axis of symmetry is a vertical line that passes through the vertex of the parabola and splits it in half. So the vertex of the parabola, I'll zoom in a little bit, is this blue dot that I'm drawing right here. It's the turning point, right? It's the maximum or minimum, depending on which way your parabola is facing. So for this problem, it is our minimum value and it is our turning point and it's that blue dot. So the, the axis of symmetry is going to be a vertical line that passes through there. So it's going to be this blue line that I'm drawing now. All right. Now vertical lines all have the same X value, right? If I look at this blue line and I go to the point, well, let's just go to the vertex to start with. This is the point negative one, negative three. If I go to the point right above it, that's negative one, negative two, negative one, negative one, negative one, zero. So you notice that every vertical line is always going to have the same X coordinate. So that's why the equation of a vertical line is always X equals some value. So that's going to help me eliminate two answer choices here that can't possibly be the answer, right? And that is three or four right off the bat are gone because those are horizontal lines and our axis of symmetry is a vertical line. So now I just have to make sure I have the right X value. My blue line goes through all points where X is negative one. And so number one is our answer choice there. All right. Number 14 is asking us about the degree of a polynomial. Again, vocabulary being so important on the regions because if you don't know what a degree is, you have no idea what you're looking for here. So the degree of a polynomial, it's in a single variable. All you're looking for is the highest exponent of the variable in that polynomial, okay? Because we only have one variable. So when I look around, the first term, the exponent of the x is an invisible one that's there. The exponent of the x in the second term is a two. That third term, negative one, is a constant, so that's in the zero degree. And my last term has an exponent of three. So again, I said the degree is just the highest exponent of the variable term when we're dealing with a single variable polynomial. So the highest exponent I see here for x is three, which means that number 14, the answer is three. The degree of this polynomial is three, which coincidentally happens to also be answer choice number three. All right, moving on, number four, sorry, number 15, says to find the product, more vocabulary. So product means that I am multiplying. Find the product of these two polynomials. So I like to write the shorter polynomial first, so I'm going to rewrite this right underneath as x minus 3 times x squared plus 3x plus 9. All right, so this is like FOIL with one extra step, right? You just have to make sure that every term in the first parentheses, so I have two terms here, an x and a negative 3, gets multiplied by every term in the other parentheses when I'm multiplying. So I'm going to start by multiplying by multiplying this x by each of the three terms that's in my second parentheses. So x times x squared is x cubed because remember when you're multiplying with the same base, you keep that base x and you add the exponents. So that's an invisible one as an exponent here and the two as the exponent in my second term. So I get x cubed to start with plus x times 3x is 3x squared. Again, same base. I keep that base x and I add those exponents, invisible one and another invisible one. So I get 3x squared. Keep going, x is going to get multiplied by that last term, 9, which is going to give me plus 9x. All right, I have multiplied x by each of the terms in the other parentheses. So now what I do is I move on to the negative 3, and that negative 3 is also going to get multiplied by each of the terms in the other parentheses. So here we go. Negative 3, don't forget that you take the sign with it. Negative 3 times 3x is going to give me negative 9x negative three times three. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have, it's the order doesn't matter, but I skipped negative three times X squared. So negative three times X squared, which would have come first is negative three X squared. I already did negative three times three X and I got negative nine X. I just wrote it first, but again, order doesn't matter. 
and then negative three times positive nine is gonna give me a negative 27. So now I've multiplied that negative three, the second term, by all the terms in the second parentheses, so I'm done. Now what you start doing is looking for like terms to see if you can combine something, add or subtract something. So remember, you can only add or subtract terms that are like terms, meaning they have the same variable and the same exponent. So let's look around and see if there's any like terms for our x cubed, our first term. There's no other term that has a x cubed, so I'm just gonna bring that down. Now I have three x squared, so I'm looking for another term that has an x squared, and I do see this minus three x squared. So when I combine those, I have plus three x squared, minus three x squared, that's zero. Those are gonna cancel out, so I don't even have to write anything. Moving on, I have positive 9x, so I'm looking for another term that just has an x, and I have it right next to it, minus 9x. So positive 9x, minus 9x, that's also zero, so those are gonna cancel out as well. And then lastly, I have this constant of negative 27 at the end, and I'm gonna bring that down because there are no other constants, so there's nothing else that I can combine that with. And when I look at my answer choices, I see that answer choice number one looks exactly like the answer that we just got. All right, number 16, we are solving a linear equation. So a bunch of different ways to do this. Um, I like to go ahead and distribute first when that's there. So this two thirds outside the parentheses is being distributed to each term inside of the parentheses. I know that because there's nothing, there's no sign, no operation in between the two thirds and the parentheses. So I'm gonna multiply two thirds times three, and that's gonna give me a positive two. I'm gonna multiply two thirds times negative two X and that's gonna give me negative four thirds X. Bring down my equal sign, bring down my three fourths. All right, I'm trying to get that X by itself. So you wanna do the inverse operations of everything else that's by that X so that we can isolate it. It's easier to get rid of addition or subtraction first, but you can do this equation in many different ways. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that constant of two. So I'm gonna subtract two because two minus two is zero, that'll cancel out. But if I do it on the left side, I also have to do it on the right side. So I'm doing minus two on both sides. That's gonna have me bring down this negative four thirds X. I'll move this up so you guys can see it. Bring down my equal sign. And then I have three fourths minus two, which is gonna give me negative five fourths. All right, one step away. I have negative four thirds being multiplied by X. There's nothing in between them, so that indicates multiplication. So the way that I'm gonna get rid of that negative four thirds is by doing the opposite. You can look at this two different ways. We can divide by negative four thirds because anything divided by itself is one, or we can multiply, and this is the same exact thing, we can multiply by the reciprocal. When I multiply a number by its reciprocal, meaning I just flipped it, I get one. So it cancels out because one times X is just X. On the right side, if I multiply negative five fourths by negative three fourths, that's gonna give me 15 over 16. X is isolated now, there's nothing else to get rid of, so I know that I am done, and I see that answer choice number four looks exactly like the answer choice in my work. All right, moving on to number 17. If F of X is two X plus six, and G of X is the absolute value of X, are graphed on the same coordinate plane, for which value of X is F of X equal to G of X? So this is essentially asking us where are they gonna intersect? That's what that means. Where does f of x equal g of x means where on a graph are they going to intersect? So you guys for the algebra regions have your graph and calculator. So throw both of these equations into your graph and calculator. The absolute value of x function is going to look like a v, right, with its vertex at the origin. So that's gonna look something like that, obviously more accurate on your graph and calculator. Um, the line 2x plus six is gonna be a line that goes through six as its y-intercept, so somewhere up here. Again, you guys are gonna have it much more accurate on your graph and calculator, and it's a positive slope, so it's gonna be going up. So on your graph and calculator, when you put both of those equations in, you should have something that looks like this, right? And again, we're looking for where do these two functions intersect, and that happens at this point right here, and that is gonna be the point negative two, two. All right, but the problem is asking us for which value of X, for which value of X are they equal? So when I look at the ordered pair where they intersect, they intersect at negative two, two, they wanna know for which value of X does that happen, so that is the value negative two. 
So my answer here is number three. All right, number 18 brings us to our first inequality. So solving inequalities is very similar to solving equations, and there's only one difference, and I'll explain it if and when we get to it. So you're trying to get the variable by itself, right? Just like an equation. So this inequality has an X on the left and the right. So I need to get that variable on one side. I can do one of two things here. I can subtract 2X from both sides to get rid of it from the left, or I can subtract 2.5X from both sides. So I'm going to subtract 2x. It doesn't matter which way you go. You'll still get the right answer as long as your math is correct. So if I subtract 2x from both sides, that's going to leave me with just the negative 7 on the left because 2x minus 2x is 0. I'm going to bring down that greater than sign. 2.5x minus 2x is 0.5x. And I'm going to bring down my plus 3. All right, trying to get the variable by itself. So you're always doing the inverse operation, the opposite of what's there. So that plus three, I can get rid of it by doing minus three. But whatever I do to the right, I also have to do to the left. So I'm going to subtract three from both sides, the same way that I would in an equation. On the left side, that's going to give me negative 10. Bring down that greater than sign is greater than 0.5x. And three minus three is zero, so that canceled out. Now I want to get x by itself, and I have a number 0.5 being multiplied by the x. I know that because there's no sign in between. So because that's multiplication, I'm going to do the inverse operation and divide by 0.5 on both sides because on the right, 0.5 divided by 0.5 is 1, and 1 times x is just x. So I've gotten x by itself, right? Now on the left, be careful. You may be remembering now the rule that's different about solving inequalities from solving equations, which is that if you multiply or divide by a negative number, you have to flip the inequality sign. However, I'm not multiplying or dividing by a negative number right now. I'm dividing by a positive 0.5. So don't let that negative 10 up there um, fool you. It depends on what you're multiplying or dividing by. So the number I'm dividing by is a positive 0.5. So no sign needs to get switched here. So I'm going to go ahead and bring down that greater than sign. And then negative 10 divided by 0.5 is negative 20. So now when I look at my answer and I look at the answer choices, they don't really look alike because I have my variable on the right. That's okay. I can always switch the order so I can put my variable on the left and my integer on the right, but I have to switch that sign. So this is going to say, sorry, x is less than negative 20. So these two things are equal. Those two inequalities are equal. Saying that negative 20 is bigger than x is the same thing as saying x is less than negative 20. Those mean the same thing, okay? So answer choice number four is the one that matches the work that I have done. All right, two more questions. Three expressions are written below. So in this case, we're going to be dealing with exponent rules, and they want to know which expressions are equivalent to 8x cubed y to the 6 power. So when you have an exponent outside of the parentheses, like you do in choice A and choice B, that 3 is outside of the parentheses, that means that 3 applies to everything inside. So I'm raising 2xy squared to the third power, all right? So I'm using the power to power rule, which means that I'm gonna multiply the exponent. So two is getting raised to the third power, so that's two to the third power. When I say multiply the exponents, there's an invisible one here for the two, right? So it's two to the one times three is three. X to the, there's also one here for the X. Be careful that two inside does not belong to the X. This two right here belongs only to the Y, okay? So the x has an invisible 1 as an exponent. So that's going to be x, sorry, that's going to be x to the third power. And then it's going to be y to the sixth power. Because again, I'm multiplying the exponents when it's a power being raised to another power. So 2 to the 1 times 3, x to the 1 times 3, and y to the 2 times 3. Now 2 to the third power means 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So I get 8 x cubed y to the sixth and that looks exactly like the expression they gave me in my question so that means that a is part of the answer um, which means if i look at my answer choices i can eliminate answer choice number two all right so i'm now 25 percent better of a chance of getting this thing right because i've eliminated one of them b 
I do have power to power again because 2x is being raised to the third power. So that's going to be 2 to the third power, x to the third power. And then outside of that, I have y to the sixth power. Well, I see that that looks exactly like the expression I had above. So b is also equivalent to x cubed, sorry, 8x cubed y to the sixth. So, so far, a and b work, uh, which means I'm going to eliminate 3 because 3 says that only a and c work. All right. C. C has two expressions being multiplied by each other. It's two parentheses. You notice the exponents are not outside of the parentheses this time. So when I have two expressions being multiplied, just like before when we multiply polynomials, you keep the base and add the exponents when the base is the same. So coefficients can always be multiplied. So I have 2 times 4 is 8. I have bases that are the same. So I have an x squared in here and I have an x in here. So I'm going to keep the base x and add the exponents, a 2 and an invisible 1 right here. So that gets me x to the third power. I have more of the same base. I have a y and a y. So I'm going to keep the base y and add the exponents. 2 plus 3 is 5. So answer choice C is equivalent to 8x cubed y to the fifth. That is not the same as what they gave me, which means that only a and b are equivalent. So that is answer choice number one. All right, last question is a word problem about depositing money and getting some interest. Joe deposits $4,000 into a certificate of deposit as local bank. The initial money you deposit is our principal amount. The CD earns 3% interest. Let's go ahead and convert that 3% right away into a decimal. So that's 0.03 compounded annually. So every year we're going to compound that the value of the CD in X years can be found using which function. So when we are looking at interest that is compounded annually, you just have to know that formula, which is going to be that F of X is equal to the principal amount, which was 4,000. So you see, they all start with 4,000 multiplied by, so a, sorry, answer choice one and answer choice two are out because we're going to multiply the principal amount by one plus the rate. So that's going to be one plus my rate was 0 0.03. That's 1.03. And that is answer choice number four. And I'm always going to raise that to the variable that represents the time. So X is representing our number of years in this problem. So my exponent should be X. All right. So that's just about knowing what the formula looks like for compound interest. So the principal amount, 4,000 multiplied by one plus the rate. So if it was a 50% interest rate, that's 0.5, then inside the parentheses, it would be 1.5, all right? And again, raise to a variable that represents the amount of time um, that we're compounding this interest. All right, that is that takes us through number 20. So we'll do some more problems in the next video. If you guys need help with a particular problem, you wanna see more problems like one of these, let me know and I'll be sure to upload some.